Hello, my name is Jerome Kim, and I'm the Director General of the International Vaccine Institute, an international organization located in Seoul, South Korea, that is dedicated to the discovery, development, and delivery of safe, effective, and affordable vaccines for global health. I'm pleased today to be able to present COVID-19 vaccine development to, the, to global healthcare resources. As you're developing a vaccine, some questions naturally come to mind fairly early on, and, and you'll understand that several of these questions are still not answered uh, 10 months into the COVID-19 pandemic. The first is, does natural COVID infection prevent reinfection? And why, is, why are we interested in that? It's because classical germ vaccine pairs um, are most successful if the initial immune response is at first successful in containing the virus, then eliminating it. And that that immune, system, that immune response usually then protects the body against reinfection. So if in fact COVID-19 infection prevents reinfection, then it may be relatively easier for us to develop a vaccine. The second question is, uh, and this has come up repeatedly, will we need seasonal COVID-19 vaccines or will this be like rotavirus where a single vaccine licensed in 2007 continues to work today? Well, I think that the one piece of potentially good news is that the rate of uh, sequence variation in COVID-19 is eight to tenfold lower than for influenza and, and thousands of times lower than for HIV. So because there's less sequence variation, then it's much more likely that, that the vaccines that were developed using strains from the beginning part of the pandemic will continue to be effective in generating infection-fighting proteins known as neutralizing antibodies that will bind to and inactivate even the current strains of COVID-19. Do we have a guarantee of that? No, we don't, because any single point mutation could potentially confer resistance uh, to immune responses. That tends not to happen for most vaccines. In fact, compared to antibiotics, for which resistance appears very uh, quickly among bacterial strains, for vaccines, resistance to vaccines develops very slowly and tends not to be um, propagated. The ne next question is, um, thinking about those immune responses, those protective responses, either, either infection fighting proteins or killer T cells that kill virally infected um, cells, which are the most important? We again, don't really know, although we have some insight from monkey models, non-human primate models. And this was a study done uh, by a colleague Dan Baruch at Harvard Medical School, and they vaccinated monkeys with a DNA vaccine and then challenged the monkeys, and the monkeys were resistant to challenge. What correlated with protection were the infection-fighting proteins, antibodies, in particular neutralizing antibodies. But what Dan found was very interesting in that other classes of antibody were also effective uh, in preventing infection with COVID-19. So some suggestion that the antibody responses are critical. We also believe, although we don't have formal proof, that having a correct balance of what we call cellular immune responses is also going to be very important, particularly uh, for vaccine safety. The next question has to do with those very monkey models. Now, which animal models are going to be predictive of the human, of what happens in humans? And we often say mice lie, monkeys exaggerate, only humans tell the truth. It's going to be very important because once we are able to show that the vaccine protects humans, we can go back to the animal models and say, well, this one works because it, it mimics what we see in humans and this one doesn't. And that's actually very important because having a, an animal model that corresponds to the human model makes future fine tuning, optimization of the vaccine or the creation of new vaccines much more efficient. The final question, the fifth question, is a really important one. And it is, are there safety concerns? Now, there are theoretical safety concerns for SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, so COVID-19 vaccines, that actually are generated not to COVID-19, but to SARS-1 the original SARS virus that appeared in 2002. When we were trying to develop vaccines against that virus, we noticed that in mice in particular, uh, with certain kinds of vaccines, uh, whole inactivated vaccines in alum, um, which are the one of the simplest forms of vaccines, just grow the virus up and kill it with heat or formalin and then inject it, that those mice could be injected. They made the correct protective responses. And if you challenge them with SARS-1, they were protected. The problem was that those mice then suffered a, an infiltration. Uh, cells appeared in the lungs, and these cells were um, similar to the cells we see in, in allergies. Uh, we call them eosinophils. And that 
enhanced respiratory disease was very reminiscent of a problem that was had back in the 1960s with an old vaccine against respiratory syncytial virus. So that theoretical concern from SARS-1 has followed us into, into MERS, which is another coronavirus, and now into SARS, uh, SARS-CoV-2. And it's something that the regulatory agencies around the world are very, very concerned about and have driven a lot of the um, recommendations for enhanced safety follow-up of volunteers who participate in trials of SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. So far, now again, as opposed to what happened with SARS-CoV-1, in none of the animal models for COVID-19 that have been looked at to date, have we seen any evidence of this enhanced respiratory disease. But again, it remains a concern in the back of our minds, and, and that's actually very important. So under normal circumstances, it takes five to 10 years to develop the vaccine, and I think most of us recognize that SARS, uh, that the COVID-19 pandemic is, is by no means a, a normal circumstance. And that follows a pretty predictable pathway. First, you do work in the laboratory. You create the vaccine, you test it in animals. If it looks good, you move it on into human clinical trials. Phase one being a trial in usually less than 50 people that lasts about a year and collects primarily safety information, but also may collect some information on whether the vaccine is making the right protective or immune response. If everything is okay, then an independent review by something called the Data and Safety Monitoring Board says, okay, proceed into phase two. In phase two, we, we actually are interested in whether the right protective responses occur in the target population. And is the vaccine safe? And phase two studies involve hundreds of people, maybe 500 or 600 individuals, and you really do collect a significant amount of information. Why is that important? Because you don't wanna go into phase three the most complex and the costliest uh, phase of vaccine development with something that you're not comfortable with. And if you're a company about to invest 500 million to a billion dollars in vaccine development, you want the pathway for vaccine development to be effectively de-risked. So phase three trials, again, are a year, year and a half, sometimes two. Actually, I was involved in a phase three trial that was three and a half years. It involves thousands or tens of thousands of people. Again, the phase three trial I was involved in, involved 16,000 individuals. Um, and at the end of the day, then you look at safety and efficacy. Does the vaccine protect against infection or disease? That is the bottom line. Does the vaccine protect and is it safe? And if you're convinced by that, then you can take the entire package, hundreds of thousands of now electronic pages and submit that to a regulatory agent, agency like the Food and Drug Administration. They will review it usually over the course of six to 12 months and come up with a, we agree with you, this vaccine is approved, or we don't agree with you, go back and, and, and answer these questions. And that's why it takes five to 10 years. But we don't have five to 10 years. And, and people have committed to doing COVID-19 vaccine development over the course of six to 18 months. And so I'm showing you a hypothetical 12-month pattern. You can see the preclinical, the animal phase, and the first phase of human testing overlap. And this can be done with certain vaccine candidates that are a platform. So if you think about DNA vaccines, generically DNA vaccines have been in thousands of people, RNA vaccines in thousands of people. So the FDA said, okay, we understand the, ve the background vectors themselves are safe. The technology is safe. So you can do the animal studies at the same time that you're starting your first in human studies. And rather than wait to the very end of phase one, at the end of a year, what you do is at uh, roughly two weeks after the, the final dose is given, and most of the COVID-19 vaccines are two doses, two weeks after the, the second dose, you say, hmm, was it, were there any safety signals? And the independent data and safety monitoring board looks at the data and says, no safety signals. You are allowed to proceed into phase two. Phase two, again, is going to have hundreds of people in it and is going to look at immunogenicity, the correct protective responses, and safety. And again, two weeks after the final vaccination in phase two, the Data and Safety Monitoring Board will review the data on hundreds of people and say, well, we see the correct protective responses, the vaccine still appears to be safe, go ahead, proceed into phase three. And again, phase three is large and complicated and the phase three trials for COVID-19 run between 30 and 60,000 individuals, usually half in placebo, half receiving vaccine. And at the end of the day, we'll look at the same thing efficacy and safety. In efficacy, in this case, it's the number of infections or the, the amount of disease that's seen in the vaccine group versus the placebo group. And if we're satisfied, and so, so I'm sorry, and with phase three, you can wait to the very end or you can have pre-scheduled 
interim analyses uh, in your statistical analysis plan. And so all of the phase three trials that have done, been done to date all have interim analysis peaks at the data at pre-scheduled times. And if you look and the vaccine looks like it's um, associated with, say, vaccine efficacy of 60% uh, with a good safety profile, then you can apply now to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration or to a regulatory agency for emergency use authorization. So it's not saying that the vaccine is registered, is approved for you know, free sale in, in a country like the United States. But what it's saying is that you are now able to give the vaccine to an expanded group of people. They have to, to get a, a piece of paper, though, that says we realize this vaccine is still experimental. There may be safety issues that are unresolved that we don't really know about. In fact, the, the FDA is so concerned that safety uh, be adequately looked at that it's requiring in its, in its guidance that you have a median of two months of follow-up um, of all the volunteers uh, in a phase three trial before they will issue the emergency use authorization. Again, very focused on safety. But compared to the regular uh, form of development, we're still using the same endpoints and we're still using the same criteria, at least the US FDA, uh, for licensure. So how do you accelerate a five to 10 year, $1 billion risk with a 93% failure rate? So if you're a vaccine company and you're thinking, well, a billion dollars, five to 10 years, 93% failure rate, but you want me to do it in one year, I'm not gonna be able to de-risk that. So how do we do that? Well, first we have to acknowledge that there's risk and then we have to mitigate it. And to accelerate the process, the government needed to de-risk the process for vaccine manufacturers. And how did they do that? They de-risked it by funding it. This is the funding provided by Operation Warp Speed. It's $10.3 billion given to the, to the vaccine companies shown on the left. And so you can see AstraZeneca with a chimpanzee adenovirus-based vector received $1.2 billion in US government funding. Now, the details of the contract are not really well, uh, are not publicly known. Johnson & Johnson, 1 billion. Moderna, 1.5 billion. In exchange, the companies agreed to provide the number of doses, there are 300 million, 100 million, 100 million, um, for the US government. Some of the manufacturing is occurring in anticipation of success. So before we actually know that the vaccine is safe and effective. Why? So that vaccine will be available uh, soon after uh, a vaccine is approved for emergency use. So the US government put in 10.3 billion. CEPI funding, Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, which the United States declined to join, uh, has 1.4 billion. Luckily, uh, CEPI has funded also a large number of these companies, including AstraZeneca through Oxford, uh, Moderna, Novavax, Inovio. And CEPI funding comes with a proviso that the vaccine have uh, be available for global access and that the vaccine be available at a reasonable cost. And we'll talk about cost a little bit later. This is a quick review of the 180 potential possible candidates. In the, in the table at the left, you see the candidates broken down into types of vaccines. And on the right, you see um, the 46 or so vaccines that are in, currently in human clinical trial testing, phase one to phase three. This is actually easier to look at. It shows the leading candidates, uh, so you can see Moderna there. Uh, and, and interestingly, it's, it's, it provides additional information. The first circle near Moderna is when the first volunteer got the vaccine. The second uh, circle is when Moderna made its press release, the first available data. The third circle is when the late phase uh, study started, so the 27th of July, uh, 2020. And the hatched bars indicate when the company has anticipated it will begin production of the vaccine. So you can see that a number of the companies, including uh, companies in, um, in China, have initiated production uh, already or will shortly initiate production. The, the yellow stars indicate companies that have received emergency use approval in the absence of safety or efficacy data. So these are uh, Chinese and Russian uh, vaccines. And the red stars indicate companies that are on clinical hold or uh, have paused the study voluntarily. So that would be Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca. Actually, in most of the world, the AstraZeneca product continues in, in, in phase three testing, uh, but in the United States, that study is um, being paused by the, by, for review by the US FDA. Uh, you can see the other studies broken down, um, all 44 of them uh, from phase one to phase three. This uh, quickly shows you the number of uh, vaccines that have had uh, animal challenge studies. So these are monkey challenge models. Um, and then interestingly, all of them, 
produce neutralizing antibody. That is infection fighting protein that binds to and inactivates the virus. So all of them see, show that. And all of them have shown protection against uh, disease. So not a lot of help there because all, of, and many of these uh, vaccines are in phase two or phase two, three um, trials. So far in, anim, in monkey studies and, and also in the un, other animal challenge studies, we have not seen evidence of this uh, vaccine associated enhanced respiratory disease or antibody dependent enhancement, the two things that we were worried about from the SARS-1 uh, vaccine experience. This is actually probably more helpful because this looks at the human data for the vaccines currently in phase three. And it breaks them down into the highest, uh, the lowest versus the highest titers of neutralizing antibody, that set of infection fighting proteins that binds to and inactivates the, the virus. And you can see there's a group of vaccines that have titers uh, under 100. 100. And then you have a second group of vaccines, Johnson Johnson, Sinopharm, Pfizer, Jenner, that are between 500 and between 100 and 500. And then you have two vaccines, Moderna and Novavax, whose titers are probably over a thousand. And I say probably because um, the way that they're reported is slightly different. So you have to make um, a theoretical adjustment. And when you do, the, the levels are well over a thousand for both of the vaccines. Um, so this is the vaccines broken down by candidate. Now, remember that all but one of these vaccines has shown protection in, in non-human primates. So what neutralizing antibody means for sure in humans, we're not really uh, certain. So proving it is only the first hurdle. There are two other major hurdles for uh, COVID-19 vaccines. We have to not only prove that it works, but we have to make it in significant quantity with high quality, and we're, then we're gonna have to use it. And if you imagine that everyone in this world, 8 billion people will need one or two, probably two doses of the COVID-19 vaccine, we're talking about 16 billion doses. Do we really have the ability to manufacture that? And how long will it take? Well, CEPI has identified that, that we, rough, we have roughly 10 billion uh, doses of vaccine manufacturing capacity around the world. COVAX, which is a, a conglomeration, a, a group of, of um, countries led by WHO, uh, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, and CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, hopes to have 2 billion doses of vaccine available by the end of 2021. Operation Warp Speed has already uh, pre-ordered uh, roughly 1.6 billion doses of vaccine. And I think one of the most important things and one of the signs that we may be in the, on the, in the way to being able to manufacture at least hundreds of millions of doses of vaccine early on is that vaccine manufacturers are licensing out their technology. So Johnson & Johnson has licensed out to Biological E, an Indian manufacturer of um, WHO pre-qualified vaccine. Uh, AstraZeneca to uh, Serum Institute of India and to SK Biosciences. Uh, Butantan has a contract with Sinovac. So globally, companies are trying to license out their vaccine. Everyone considers this a race. Is it the United States vaccine, the Chinese vaccine, the European vaccine? Well, this is not a race between companies. This is a race that we need to win for humanity, uh, for the benefit of all the people in this world. And do laurels really go to the first to prove efficacy, that is safety, uh, and that the vaccine protects against infection or disease? Or do, do the, does the prize really go to the company or group of companies that can make hundreds of millions of doses of safe and effective vaccine and get them into the arms of the people who need the vaccine? So access and equity, and, and this is the final piece. Um, there are a lot of discussions with something called COVAX, which is a, um, a group of, um, of countries, actually over 180 countries now, um, 90 of which have actually signed contracts with COVAX. Um, this is an organization um, brought together by CEPI, the World Health Organization, and Gavi. COVAX hopes to have 2 billion doses of WHO pre-qualified vaccine by the end of 2021. This corresponds to roughly 20% of global need. This will allow countries to vaccinate the elderly and high-risk populations and presumably healthcare workers. So again, groups that should get the vaccine first. Um, other plans are being made for beyond 2021 if there is not sufficient vaccine available um, or a supply of vaccine available in, at the end of 2021. And you can see the operating principles of COVAX to accelerate equitable access listed there. Global access, impact and transparency, solidarity and collective ownership around the vaccine solution, not ownership of the vaccine. <coughs> so with regard to equity and access, we really do need COVAX. What you see on the left are the different companies. And what you see on the right 
are the countries or uh, regions that have purchased those vaccines. So, so far we have 4 billion doses of vaccine ordered by high income countries, the US, the EU, the United Kingdom and Japan. And what we want to avoid is a situation like what happened with rotavirus. So rotavirus vaccine is a real success. We introduced rotavirus vaccine in the US in 2007. By 2009, rotavirus diarrhea had nearly disappeared from US uh, children. Um, WHO approved rotavirus and recommended rotavirus vaccine in 2009. In 2020, 60% of the children in this world do not receive all three doses of rotavirus vaccine. That implementation gap, if it translates to COVID, could have uh, disastrous consequences. And you see in the little black box warning at the bottom, modeling from the Gates Foundation suggests that if the high income countries take the first 2 billion doses without some equity and distribution, global COVID death rates will double and highly likely that the, our efficiency at being able to control the epidemic globally uh, will be impaired. So again, a global solution is a solution that works for everyone. Um, and this is uh, more information on rotavirus. So final thoughts. We will likely have evidence of efficacy and safety later this year, so November, December, or January of 2021. But what does the day after efficacy look like? Well, the big question is, who is going to make it? Are we going to be able to ensure access and equity and allocation? And then some other really big questions are scientific. How high are these immune responses? What is the, um, the size of the immune response that is generated by the different vaccines? And how long will they last? Is this a vaccine that we have to give boosters for every six months, which will be impractical? Uh, or can we wait two or three years before we have to give someone a booster dose? We also have been rushing through development, so we haven't had time necessarily to optimize the dose. Could we get away with a lower dose? Do we need a higher dose? Those are all very important questions because they impact vaccine supply. What is the schedule? You know, we are giving things at zero and one month, typically. Um, is it better to give it at zero and six months? Do you get higher magnitude, uh, longer lasting um, protective responses? Again, we don't know. And do we need boosts? And can we give mixed boosts? Can you give a person an RNA vaccine from Moderna and then give them the chimpanzee adenovirus from AstraZeneca? We don't know. <clears throat> the second are correlates of protection those laboratory uh, findings that would indicate exactly what is protecting people. And this is really important because a correlate of protection helps to speed up, make more efficient, shorter and cheaper, the process of developing new vaccines or optimizing the old vaccine regimens. The next aspect is what I call real world evidence. So it's one thing to have a trial where 15,000 people get vaccine, 15,000 people get placebo, and you follow people very closely and you watch them for side effects and you watch them to see who gets infected or not. But what happens when you get out into the real world? And that's actually a critical question because it will help governments to answer the question about herd immunity. So everyone knows about herd immunity and how dangerous it would be if we allowed herd immunity to proceed in the United States in the absence of a vaccine, the hundreds of thousands of people who would die. But herd immunity can be induced by vaccination. So with measles vaccine, you have to vaccinate 95% of the population in order to achieve herd immunity. With influenza vaccine, it may be something more like 40%. What is the level of vaccination necessary to achieve herd immunity for COVID-19? We really don't know. How will the vaccine work when nurses from study sites aren't chasing down volunteers to say, hey, you know, come in for your dose tomorrow? Um, what's it going to be like when this vaccine is rolled out uh, in the final analysis? Another very important part is long-term safety follow-up. So we usually report adverse events following immunization, and the United States and other Western countries have very good systems uh, for tracking these AEFI. They're very important because sometimes they will reveal a problem that you didn't see if you were uh, testing the vaccine in, in six months or 12 months, or in, in our case now, um, maybe less than six months. Um, and so these AEFI reports are going to be very important and we may need to strengthen healthcare systems around the world because we may see different things uh, in the United States as we see in Africa or South America or South Asia. So again, we need to really keep an eye on safety. Big question around licensure versus emergency use. So we know that the Russians and the Chinese have already issued emergency use uh, authorizations for vaccines that haven't been shown to be safe and effective. What happens when we have one and the FDA says it's okay? How are we going to do that? How are we going to handle that? How will the WHO handle it? And again, these are questions that, that can't be answered uh, right now. And finally, we have to anticipate 
and take care of potential future issues around vaccine hesitancy, anti-science attitudes, anti-mask attitudes, because again, vaccines will be a part of a, of a comprehensive solution uh, until we can get enough people vaccinated uh, to, have, to achieve herd immunity. Conspiracy theory. So all of these things are things we should anticipate and hopefully um, be able to deal with before they impede our ability to provide protective immunity to the population through vaccination. So the final question, how long and hard will it be to get back to the old normal um, is the one that we really have to answer. Thank you.